hospitalizations for heart failure, we now have a new therapy. This was uh, published back in 2010 that reduces heart failure hospitalization. Uh, but yet, the uptake of this drug has been quite slow. Importantly, if you look, so again, to reframe this, so this drug was, or was the results were published in 2010. It was incorporated into the guidelines in Europe in 2012. It goes through starting ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, MRAs, the other therapies, and then identifying the right patient population and considering this. So really within two years, incorporated into the European guidelines. But if we look at the U.S. story, it's quite different. So the, the study was published in, on September 11, 2010. Europe approved this in 2012, incorporated quickly into their guidelines. The U.S. story is quite different. It wasn't FDA approved until April of 2015. It was subsequently incorporated into the guideline update in 2016 in May. So here's just the recommendation. It is a class two recommendation, so one step below the top, and it's really just because it's based on this single trial uh, for heart failure patients with reduced ejection fraction, but very beneficial with nearly a 20% reduction in heart failure hospitalization. Now the bad news. So no one is using this therapy. In the United States, there really aren't even great data to characterize the overall use, but it's less than 5% of eligible populations. And I'd like to get into some of the reasons for that and some of the things we're trying to do now to better explore and understand the slower uptake and how we can try to improve this not only with this therapy, but with other therapies. So prior authorization forms are required. This is a lot of paperwork, and I'll show an example of what this involves that the doctors and their clinical teams need to fill out. It's expensive. So the Corlin Already program is a third-party hub that can try to assist filling out these prior authorization forms and helping to try to find strategies to reduce costs. And this is what the website says. It says, eligible patients with commercial insurance and most Medicare patients will pay no more than $20 a month. Importantly, the, their follow-up is, I think this, the later bullet here is really striking. So the patients that do not have strong insurance or are underinsured, they can save up to $250 in savings per month, which gives you a sense of how expensive this medication can be. And actually just looking, just yesterday at the price of what patients out of pocket would pay for this, on average of $450 a month for those patients that do not have supportive commercial insurance. This is an exorbitant amount of money for patients that are gonna be on at least three, four medications for their heart failure. This is an example of what these prior authorization forms look like. So it basically goes through, you provide the patient's history, you go through, are they on any of these medications that are contraindicated with Ivabradine, going through the other contraindications based on how the trial was performed. And then you have to go through each of these label indications and provide this information before the insurance will potentially cover this. This takes on order of 10 to 15 minutes per patient to complete this information. I'd like to go through two recent kind of opinion pieces from Milton Packer that really highlighted how insane this can be for both providers and for patients. So he talks in this editorial cited here where he was giving a lecture to a number of physicians that seemed to be a little bit on the older side. He got to talking to them after going through a number of these recent updates in terms of these beneficial effects of these therapies and said, well, who are you guys? I've got to know. And what they told him was that they are the folks that actually deny the prior authorization requests. Their sole job is to review these papers that are submitted and largely deny them. And what, what they said, you know, he talks to them and says, well, didn't I just go through all this data like I've tried to do here with you all? Aren't you convinced this is going to help patients? He said, oh, yeah, this is very convincing. But, you know, it is our goal. We, you know, if we don't reduce the use of this therapy and, and really make this a challenge, then the healthcare system is just going to be financially destroyed. So it just shows you this provocative opinion and perspective on the denials of these prior authorizations for medications that have been shown to have substantial benefits for our patients. The second one from him is also quite fascinating. So he draws a parallel between the oncologic space and in cardiology, and he talks how in oncology, because they can make so much money and really help get these drugs out for patients, that they have clinicians and clinician support staff that are filling out, they're largely full-time staff that are filling out all these prior authorization pieces. Whereas you look, in cardiology, that's just not possible. You know, John Alexander walks in, I, I guarantee you, he says to his, his, 
he's been supporting his, his staff building out all these paperwork. But you know, this is largely dependent upon the clinical workforce to do all these activities. And as a result, in cardiology, it takes so much longer to have uptake of these therapies. And it means that cancer patients, in many respects, are getting these newer drugs quicker in contrast to our cardiology patients. So in this context, years ago, uh, as Ivabertine was just getting approved, we really wanted to better understand how we can incorporate this therapy into practice. So along with Adrian Hernandez and Adam DeVore, we developed this study called Prime HF that was to look at implementation of this therapy in the inpatient setting. So really trying to get patients on this drug after stabilization in the hospital. So we were actually randomizing patients to starting this therapy in the hospital so that they could have this as part of their regimen versus going as outpatients and just doing the usual provider approach to clinical care. So we started this several years ago, and it's been such a challenge to enroll patients in this because of the low use of this drug. So in this context, we've really pivoted and are now capturing patients in more in the framework of a registry of understanding, would this therapy be appropriate, and what are the barriers to use of this? So now we have a long laundry list of information we're capturing to better understand in appropriate selected patients, why aren't they getting this? Did you try to complete this prior authorization form? Is it still under review? Was it rejected? Have you looked at different support strategies for this patient? So even now, a, a, a literature search of trying to understand how, what percentage of the population is using Ivabradine in the U.S., you really can't even find the data. They're not out there. There are very limited details available in terms of what are these actual barriers. So we're capturing information related to how much, what is the out-of-pocket cost for these patients in each of these aspects of barriers. So I think this, unfortunately, is a therapy that has really struggled to have clinical use and really uptake into the clinical community. However, I think this work will not only inform the Ivabradine experience, but will inform other therapies down the line of using these therapies and understanding the, the challenges. So that was a whirlwind tour through the first one. And Marie only gave me five more minutes to go through this next one, so I'm going to jump through this quickly. Um, but this is a, an immensely fascinating medication. It's called Secupitril Valsartan, or LCZ696. That's the name as it was being developed. The trade name is Entresto. My mom calls this Ernesto, uh, <laughs> but it, it's at least close enough. So in heart failure patients, you have kind of two different pathways, at least, that are activated. You have the RAS activation. So this leads to all the detrimental effects of scarring in the heart and systemic complications. At the same time, you have the nitritic peptide system. So these are positive vasodilators. So what this new compound combines, it combines valsartan, which is an angiotensin receptor blocker. It blocks the bad stuff. In addition, it also blocks the breakdown of the good things. So the net effect is that you're blocking the bad stuff and enhancing these good characteristics. So these are the primary data for the primary endpoint in the paradigm study of over 8,000 patients worldwide. And it compared enalapril, the medication we've been using for years and years and years. So this was an active comparator against Entresto. This was a remarkable effect. So a 20% reduction in the primary endpoint, 16% reduction in mortality, comparing what we've been using historically for years and years now. A number to need, need a treat of 21. So just comparing this, if you look ACE or ARB, the benefit here, an additional 20% reduction um, in cardiovascular outcomes in these patients. So this is for the statisticians in the room. This is from Stu Pocock. I don't claim to understand this, but I think it's a fascinating story. So what they say is, so, well, don't you usually need at least two studies to approve a new agent? Uh, so this study, this finding is so robust that if you look, it's effectively the equivalent of multiple studies demonstrating this, this same effect. So it's such a large patient population with such a large effect size. So he says, after this fancy calculation here, that it's equivalent of four to five trials. I only put this up here just to show you the uh, statistical footwork you can do, but the, the interesting aspects around this from a clinician perspective. So these are all the headlines that came out as this study was published. Wow, this is the, a real game changer. My favorite's the last one. Blockbuster is not just a defunct video store. <laughs> So really getting at this idea of, so we had Ivabradine. This was published four years to the day before the Paradigm study was published. So you see four years after you have uh, Paradigm coming out, Europe, this was approved quickly. It was actually much quicker in terms of approval in the US. It was incorporated in the guidelines in May of 2016. Here's just the most recent. It's a class one recommendation now to use this therapy, meaning we really should 
uh, be using these either in all patients, ACE, ARB, or ARNI, this is that class of medication, and maybe even replacing uh, these other historic therapies in appropriately selected patients. But again, we see such slow use of this therapy. So this was a really nice um, paper that Nancy Liu, one of our fellows, uh, published, led by uh, Emily O'Brien here. So looking in the Get With the Guidelines uh, Heart Failure Registry of understanding in appropriate patients for this therapy, what was the use over the first year after it was FDA approved? And overall, it was 2% of eligible patients were receiving this drug. And if you look, uh, this is the, the overall axis from 0 to 100 in terms of ARNI prescription rates. It's quite low. You can see the, this vertical line, that's at six months after FDA approval, and the inset is just blown up with a, it goes from zero to six percent. So it is increasing slowly over time, but maybe upwards of six percent of eligible, eligible patients at a year after approval of this therapy. And this was a nice uh, piece from Greg Fonero and Adrian that looked at, so what does this actually mean? What is the, the net result in terms of how many people are dying as a result of this? And it's upwards of estimated about 30,000 lives could have been saved if this had already, on an uh, annual basis, if this had already been incorporated. So really tremendous uh, in terms of the burden of heart failure in patients that are not getting this therapy. So why such limited use? Why is this cardiology space so different than some of the other spaces? Is this a patient perspective? I think as I've tried as a provider talk to patients about this, I try to frame it in a balanced perspective they say, oh, no, no, I don't want to be a guinea pig. You know, this hasn't been around that long. So really this idea of how can we, through shared decision-making, better have these conversations to, to actually try to get patients on these appropriate medications. It is costly, and there are these prior authorization forms. This is improving. Actually, in yesterday, as I initiated a patient on this, I said, asked my, my nurse so I could give you the real-time information. She said, oh, yeah, it's definitely getting better, but it's still a pain in the butt uh, in many respects with different fights over this with insurance companies. And then there are a number of clinical trial aspects, which I won't go through all of them. Um, but there were some unique aspects of this study that from a trialist perspective, there was a run-in period. So patients had to tolerate high doses of both enalapril and Entresto before they were even randomized. And 10,000 patients were screened, 2,000 of them dropped out before randomization. And those that dropped out tended to be sicker. Uh, in addition, there were some, you know, as you're trying to show the efficacy of a therapy in a trial, the applicability in terms of actual effectiveness in clinical practice has been questioned. Uh, it hasn't been tested in the acute heart failure space. It hasn't been tested in those patients with slightly lower blood pressure or worse renal function. Uh, and some other kind of key pieces are questions around real-world data. I'm struck by, as we talk in the community, of why aren't we using this therapy? The American Family Physician Guidelines are so critical of this and actually recommend, their recommendation related to this is to not use it. It's really striking if you compare uh, these different guidelines. So in that context, here at DCRI, uh, our group and many others have really tried to provide this unmet need around the data to answer some of these questions. So we're involved now with Provide HF, which is looking at in a real world setting what happens to quality of life in patients as we start this therapy, really trying to have a patient-focused perspective. Because patients, when you talk to them, they don't want to just stay out of the hospital and live longer. They want to live better and actually have an improvement in their symptoms. And we really don't have those data. Adam DeVore and Adrian Hernandez are leading the Connect HF, a quality improvement initiative, a piece around which includes uh, guideline-driven therapies such as Entresto. The acute heart failure study led by Eric Velasquez looking uh, at in-hospital initiation and then Adrian and others are, through the Heart Failure Network are leading the life study, the sickest patients. So those with the worst symptom burden, there were only 33 of them in this 8,000 patient study that had NYHA class four, the most severe symptoms. So really trying to see whether we can add additional evidence around these other pieces. I'll just skip over that. So in the last uh, two minutes and 30 seconds that Emory has allotted me, I'm gonna go through a lot of the incredible work that Emily and others have helped lead around adoption of this therapy. So this is an older slide that highlights this Institute of Medicine report. And this, the figures vary, but on average, uh, the report is that it takes anywhere from 13 to 17 years from the generation of clinical trial evidence to actual implementation of these therapies and broad adoption. So really a striking figure. Um, so through the early adopter program that Emily's leading, uh, 
we're trying to really tackle each of these aspects. So we don't want to just say we have a therapy that works. We want to understand what matters to patients around clinical endpoints. So I'll go through some of the aspects of understanding what's desired and prioritized by patients with heart failure in general and then also specifically with this therapy. Understanding, uh, building upon some of the work Emily and others have done to understand this concept of home time. Patients don't just want to stay out of the hospital and live longer. They want to be at home having a good quality of life and whether we can have some innovative means to actually look at that in this population. And then finally, better understanding, so who is using this therapy? And can we identify some characteristics of hospitals that can then inform how we could roll out future therapies? Uh, and uh, this last question is really interesting. Do guidelines actually matter? Do they lead to enhanced utilization of this? So in short, I'll just summarize by saying we conducted focus groups and really uh, heard a patient perspective and are now doing a larger uh, national questionnaire of understanding patient preferences. Uh, we're doing a number of analyses to better understand and get with the guidelines and CMS data what is the actual breakdown of hospitals using this therapy. So this is just a figure that shows percentage of hospital discharges with an RNA prescription. On the far left, you have those hospitals that have zero patients that were sent home on an RNA during this period. And you see the kind of middle group where you do see some use. And then there's these, this early adopter group that's really embracing this at least upwards of 20% or more use. And as we looked at all these characteristics, you know, was it places like Duke, these tertiary care facilities, you know, what was, was it bed size, other aspects? It was higher use in for-profit hospitals uh, and lower use in, in some of the different regions. But really none of the other clinical factors shuffled out in terms of predictors of, of early use of this. And the final piece I, I'll close with is the question is, so can we look at the adoption of this therapy, look at when guidelines came out, and then model the predicted increase over time versus what we actually see to tease out this question. Uh, and I'll tell you, it's actually a, a little depressing. So th the middle is where the guidelines came out. So you can see the use slowly increasing over time. The projected is this red if there were no guideline. And the black dots are what was actually observed with the confidence intervals being in red. And basically what you see is it's consistent with just slow uptake over time. It was no light switches. You, you have these guidelines come out, which I think does provide some context as we move forward of figuring out we don't just need guidelines. We need actual multidimensional implementation strategies to use these therapies. Uh, so I am going to pause there. Uh, I want to leave plenty of time for Anne-Marie to go through all her stuff and for questions at the end and, and thank the team here. But uh, you know, I think in closing, it's been really exciting to see these new therapies, but also really understand we don't want to just generate the evidence. We need to figure out how we implement this into clinical practice and understand the barriers and have a patient-centered focus as we move forward. Thank you so much. So it was bad enough for um, heart failure drugs, it's even worse for new cholesterol drugs. And um, I'm going to talk about some work that we've done here at the DCRI um, looking at access to new lipid lowering therapies. And before I begin, I want to point out um, Hillary Mulders, our statistician, has done the uh, majority of the programming and analysis for this and has really been sort of great at um, helping us meet some quick deadlines to prevent getting scooped. And this work is also with Eric Peterson, as well as some uh, additional colleagues from across the U.S. Um, I have a lot of disclosures. There they are. So what's a PCSK9 inhibitor? A PCSK9 inhibitor is a cholesterol-lowering medication. And basically, PCSK9 is a little protein that binds to the LDL receptor that sits on the outside of a cell. That receptor is what pulls LDL cholesterol into the blood to break it down. So if you don't have those receptors on the cell, you can't break down cholesterol, your cholesterol is higher. So if you inhibit the protein, you make more of those receptors stay on the cell, you pour more, pull more cholesterol out of the blood, your LDL cholesterol is much lower. And this is really a um, kind of success story for medical research. Um, in 2003, there was a family that was identified, or a cluster of families, that had a genetic mutation that um, was a defect in the LDL receptor, and they, these people had really, really high LDL cholesterols. 
Subsequent work identified people with the inverse mutation who had really low cholesterol, and lo and behold, they had much lower risk of heart disease. So pharma was able to replicate this as a drug, make an inhibitor, and by 2015, so within 12 years of identifying this cluster of patients, we had an FDA-approved therapy based on this mechanism to lower cholesterol. The elephant in the room, though, is that this therapy costs $14,000 per year. So um, $500 a month is actually sounds pretty good when you're talking about heart failure drugs. So $14,000 a year, it's really expensive. Um, and, you know, when the drug first came out and there were initial cost-effectiveness estimates, the estimate was there was about a, a million people with familial hyperlipidemia and about 8.5 million people with established cardiovascular disease who needed further lipid-lowering therapy. That was sort of what was in the FDA indication. And at that cost per year, it was going to cost the healthcare system $3.3 trillion. So everybody panicked about how expensive these cholesterol drugs were. And um, that you know, the cost savings would only be $155 billion even based on the best estimate. So, so this is going to bankrupt the system, and we have to do something about it. Now, I have to mention, though, before we move on, that $14,000 is a made-up number that nobody actually pays. So it comes with a really big asterisk. Because at the end of the day, the way that drug prices are set is there's a sticker price that the manufacturer sets. Then each individual payer or PBM negotiates their own rate with the pharmaceutical company. And then after that, there are back uh, sort of under the table rebates that aren't even made uh, clear to the public. So it's probable that people are only paying about half this much per year, but nobody knows because our system's too obscure because the PBMs or the pharmacy benefit managers who are the middlemen between this are able to pocket the difference or as much of the difference as they want. So there's no price transparency in this. So when people are arguing or yelling about $14,000, Cut that in half. Now, Express Scripts came out as the like big PBM in the room and said, well, we're going to make this better. It's not going to bust the budget. And in fact, we're really happy to let you know that in the first year um, that these have been available, or the first few months that we've been, that's been available, we've actually rejected a surprisingly high number of um, prescriptions. I don't think this was a surprise. So um, the PBMs came out having rejected a large number of the early prescriptions, claiming that they were saving money to the health system, and proud of it for how much money they've been saving. And the way that they do this is through red tape and by um, a sort of a combination of two levers that the PBMs have to pull. One lever that they have to pull is copay, or how much out-of-pocket cost a patient has. And the other lever is how hard is it to get the prescription authorized through the provider. And Steve Nissen uh, described this saying that the barriers that the PBMs have set up to get patients on P PCSK9 inhibitors are the reason that sales have been slow. So we decided to look at this in the, and as a national trend in the first year of PCSK9 availability to see the degree to which these two different levers were affecting patient access to novel lipid-lowering therapies of PCSK9. There's really two. There's one called Evo and one called Ali Um and we used data from a company called Symphony Health Solutions, which took pharmacy transaction data. And their data set covers about 90% of retail pharmacies in the U.S. and the vast majority of mail order and specialty pharmacies. So we get almost every PCSK9 prescription in the United States. We took patients who were newly prescribed a PCSK9 inhibitor in the first year that they were available from the FDA and looked at the first 24 hours in the ultimate patient status. And then amongst those approved, whether or not they actually picked it up from the pharmacy. We had about 45,000 patients newly prescribed a PCSK9 inhibitor. About half of those were prescribed by a cardiologist, and the vast majority of the other half were prescribed by primary care docs. And here's what we found. In the first 24 hours that patients were uh, submitted a claim for a PCSK9 inhibitor, almost 80% were rejected outright. This is a typo, but only about 73% of those were appealed. 26.5% of those prescriptions were not appealed. But even after appeals, ultimately, greater than half of prescriptions that were submitted were rejected by payers, so never received approval. So of the 40, 45,000 patients prescribed, about 21,000 received approval. But it doesn't stop there, because even after approval, one in three patients failed to pick up the medication from the pharmacy, and so that drug was abandoned. At the end of the day, fewer than one in three patients prescribed a PCSK9 inhibitor got one. Now, the Express Script CEO said, well, this is just in the first few months. We think that as doctors get better at learning who they should be prescribing it for and completing the paperwork, that this process is going to improve. 
And in fact, we did see an increase in prescription volume over the first year that PCS canines were available. What we did not see was a corresponding improvement in approval or abandonment rates. And in fact, towards the end of 2016, we actually saw a decrease in the approval rates over time. We also saw that this is a really cumbersome process for the providers. As I had per personally experienced in clinic with numerous phone calls to um, payers and PBMs, it takes a long time to both fill out the paperwork and then you have to get on hold and you're on, you have to refill out the forms and fax it in and then they have to review it. And what ends up happening is that it takes a long time for many patients between the time they see the doctor in clinic to when they actually get drug in hand. And in fact, although 50% of patients had their approval happen within three days, the interquartile range was 18 days, which meant that one in four patients that got approved didn't get approved for at least three weeks. And what that meant is that the upper limit of the interquartile range for those who picked it up was over a month. We wanted to know whether or not Express Scripts was right, and we were just writing prescriptions for the wrong patients. And while we couldn't do in-depth chart reviews for 45,000 patients to see how many met every single particular clinical characteristic, we would expect that if this was all due to clinical issues, we would see a correlation between clinical factors that are required for approval and approval rates. So we looked at a few characteristics that are required for PCSK9 approval. So prior atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease is one indication for patients for PCSK9s. And there was only a slight increase in the odds of approval if you had cardiovascular disease versus not, and the confidence interval overlapped one. To get approval for a PCSK9, you also should theoretically be on a maximally tolerated statin. What we saw was that there was no association between statin use and whether or not patients received approval. There was only a slight association between azetamibe use and approval, and there was absolutely zero correlation between a patient's LDL levels at the time of prescription and whether or not they got approved for a PCSK9. So if it's not clinical factors driving approval, what is it? Well, it's all of the other stuff. So compared to a retail pharmacy, your odds of receiving approval were much higher if you submitted your prescription to a specialty pharmacy or a mail order pharmacy. And that's probably because these pharmacies actually have support systems intact that work with patients and PBMs to complete the paperwork. There are specialty pharmacies that are literally building businesses out of completing and shepherding prior authorization paperwork through the process. Cardiologists had a light, uh, slightly increased ap approval rate compared to family docs. Endocrinologists did not. That might speak to the availability in certain cardiology practices of nurses that are dedicated to paperwork. And then patients with government insurance actually had much higher approval rates than patients with commercial insurance. We saw that the rejection rate varied highly by who was your PBM and who was your provider. So these are, these are rejection rates for the top 10 pharmacy benefit managers by volume in our sample. What we see is that the approval rate by PBM varies from about 1 in 3 to, two, to sev over 77%. So a lot of variability in terms of whether or not you got approval by who was your PBM and who was servicing your claim. There were also differences by the type of government insurance you had, as well as um, by commercial payers and plans. So it seems to matter a lot more who's your provider, what pharmacy do you go to, who's your PBM, than whether or not you have extremely high LDL and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And this was the next piece of it, which is that getting through approval was only the first half. You still had to pick up the medication from the pharmacy. And one in, four, one in three patients failed to pick up the prescription from the pharmacy. Now, is that because they're lazy or they don't care about their heart disease? No. It's because of cost. So we looked at the impact of cost on whether or not patients picked up the prescription from the pharmacy. And this histogram or this bar graph shows um, this, the orange bars are the second y-axis. This is the number of patients who um, were approved for a PCSK9 inhibitor and what their copay was. So what you see is there were about you know, over 4,000 patients with a $0 copay. But actually a quarter of patients had a copay per month of $300 or more. So the expectation was that even after approval, their out-of-pocket cost would be over $10 a day for PCSK9 therapy. Corresponding uh, rates of picking up the drug from the pharmacy dropped precipitously with copay. So this blue bar is a percent of patients who picked up the prescription at each level of copay. What you see is that at a copay less than $20, almost 100% of patients picked up the medication from the pharmacy. This dropped off substantially starting at $20 a month. 
and leveled off at about $300, where over $300, fewer than one in three people can actually afford to pick up the medication from the pharmacy. So what we're seeing here is sort of the combination of both levers, the prior authorization process and then copay at limiting access to therapy for patients. So this isn't a perfect study, none of them are. Um, our indication and uh, specific clinical data were unavailable, so some of these rejections are likely clinically appropriate. Um, our analysis was based on the patient starting with their first prescription. We hope in future analyses to look at subsequent uh, prescriptions. We think this is highly representative of the United States, but maybe there's something magical happening in the 20% of pharmacies that Symphony doesn't cover. And um, this is an early snapshot in the first year and may be different now that we have outcomes data from the Fourier trial. Our take home was that over two thirds of patients prescribed therapy never get it. Rejections are likely not all due to clinical factors that this process is prolonged and impacts both patients and doctors, and that out-of-pocket cost is driving abandonment. So in subsequent work, we're trying to understand what's happening now. So we've taken patients who went through the MyProluent hub, which is the uh, sort of similar copay access hub um, that uh, is available for heart failure studies, and uh, reached out to them via online surveys, and trying to understand what's happening to them now. These are data from about 800 patients who have filled out our survey thus far, and what we found is that our cost data are, are staying about the same. This was sort of a, a reassurance that we're getting a reasonable snapshot of our patients, where about 18% of patients paid over $400 and 7% between $300 and $400, so pretty similar um, cost distribution and how much patients are expected to pay out of pocket. And what we're finding is that even after patients are getting on therapy, one in three patients who initiate therapy have discontinued by the time we asked the survey, many of them within six months. And the reason for that is almost entirely driven by cost. So the number one and two reason why patients are stopping therapy is because the out-of-pocket costs are too high or they don't have insurance approval. And one of the pieces that we're going to continue to explore is not only the initial approval, but now the payers are requiring a concept called reauthorization where after six months of being on therapy, you have to submit that your lipid levels are appropriately lowered so that you can continue to receive approval for the high cost of therapy. Very, very few patients are discontinuing because they didn't like shots or they didn't think they needed it. Um, there's also other potential future payment models that are trying to be developed to address this issue. So, you know, what do we do? We've got these competing priorities of high cost, we can't get it to everybody, we can't afford it. So what are the payers doing to try to solve this problem? Cigna has two value-based contracts with um, pharmaceutical companies that's sort of Regeneron, Sanofi, and Amgen, the two makers of PCSK9, um, that basically link outcomes to the cost of therapy. Um, and and what the, what the, what's in the contract is that if you can guarantee that, if you can show that a patient's adherent to the PCSK9, and their LDL doesn't reduce, then they'll give you the money back for the treatment. So Sanofi and Regeneron or Amgen say, we'll give you, uh, we'll give you your money back that you spent on your patient's PCSK9 if you can prove they're adherent and it doesn't lower their LDL. So it's a nice thought, except there's two problems with it. Although it does ensure LDL lowering and it puts the health systems on the hook for prescription adherence, it completely ignores appropriate patient selection. In fact, it encourages you to be treating the patients who are adherent and not the patients who might benefit the most. The other thing is that in the Fourier trial, the benefit to PCSK9 therapy was completely independent of starting LDL. So in fact, those who had an LDL less than 70 to begin with benefited just as much as those who had an LDL of 160. So if you're linking to cholesterol lowering, you might actually end up missing patients with the lower LDLs that would still benefit. And then finally, this really keeps lipid lowering in a silo, and it doesn't think about CVD risk as a sort of whole package. Repatha came out with this, or uh, Amgen came up with this at the time that Fourier uh, was released. Heart attack on Repatha, Amgen will give you your money back. Um, and basically, it was sort of a, a really nice marketing campaign. They said, we, we have these Fourier results, PCSK9's lower cardiovascular events and high-risk cardiovascular patients, and we believe in it so much that if your patients have a heart attack while they're on the drug, we'll give you your money back for it. Sounds great, right? Except in the Fourier trial, fewer than 10% of patients actually had an event. So you could treat you know, a, a ton of patients with a completely inefficacious drug and still only have to return 10% of the profits. So it's a nice thought, but it really doesn't encourage treating the highest-risk patients 
nor does it guarantee effectiveness of the therapy. So there's a little bit of competing incentives here. And the one thing that's good about it, though, is that if you are getting your money back for having a heart attack on Repatha, if you're a health system or you're a payer, then you want to treat the highest risk patients who are most likely to have a heart attack to begin with. So if you're treating patients who have a baseline risk of 40% of a recurrent MI, and even with a 50% relative risk reduction, you'll get your, your money back for one in five patients on treatment. On the pharma side, though, it actually then creates a perverse incentive to be treating the lowest risk patients because regardless of whether or not the therapy is effective, if the patient wasn't going to have an event to begin with, you're not going to have to be returning the money. So where do I think the future is? I don't think it's in tying reimbursement to LDL lowering, nor do I think it's tying reimbursement uh, gimmicks to having a heart attack on therapy. I think we need to have approval criteria that are based on individual patient benefit of therapy. And that combines two things. It combines what's their risk of having another cardiovascular disease event, and then how much does their LDL change on treatment. So while starting LDL is completely uh, unrelated to whether or not you benefit from PCSK9 therapy, how much your LDL actually changes on therapy does correlate with your benefit. So in fact, if you have an LDL of 160 and drop to 120, you benefit less than if you have 160 and go down to about 50. So we can actually capture this both by estimating a patient's risk of recurrent events as well as measuring their delta of LDL on treatment to estimate the individualized benefit and cost effectiveness for individual patients. For providers, we need to have standardized approval criteria. And um, the American College of Preventive Medicine has teamed up with the um, various national lipid organizations, including the NLA, to come out with a position statement talking about how we need to have standardized criteria for prior authorization, as well as standardized forms. Because it's not just about how onerous the criteria are, it's also about the forms. Rob's form was um, a, a good one to highlight, and I will do that in my future talks. Some of these forms, they put LDL on the first page, HDL on the second page, total cholesterol on the third page, and triglycerides on the fourth page. So they make it really hard to fill out, or you have to be on hold for 30 minutes just to get access to the paperwork, which then you have to fax in. So these things actually affect whether or not providers are filling it out and whether or not they're filling it out in ways that are getting through, um, through the process. So we need standardized criteria that limit the provider burden. And then finally, the cost issue is real. And while private, privately insured patients can use copay cards that are provided by companies that offset their out-of-pocket cost, government insured patients cannot. There's a law that says if you have government insurance, you can't use a, a copay card. Now that law is in place to keep patients from using higher price name brands when there are generic alternatives available. So you don't need to have $200 a month Nexium if you can take $20 a month Proton or Prilosec. On the other hand, when there aren't generic avail options available, what not having copay cards does is essentially limits access to new therapies for patients with government insurance who can't afford higher copays. And that injects yet another uh, financial burden on patients and more financial inequity in who has access to therapies. So at the DCRI, we're working on a number of these things, um, including building better uh, risk models to estimate the risk of recurrent cardiovascular disease events. And we hope to not just develop those models, but then apply them in health systems to simulate what patients we should be treating or targeting with PCSK9s, figuring out how can we identify a group of patients in whom therapies may be more cost, eff cost effective, and then how can we maximize the utilization of therapies in those high-risk groups. Thanks. So, uh, so I'm totally depressed. <laughs> this is like you guys have Just described in because of this. these incredible <laughs> therapies that were that are impossible to use in U.S. healthcare. I mean, Emory, you mentioned one thing, which is like uh, so. Other countries have are also far from um, effective at getting things implemented. Some countries better than others, but with totally different barriers. What? What can we learn from like can what's happening like in Canada, places where there's um, maybe different access issues? But um, you know, can we learn from some of these other countries about some opportunities? 
so I don't. I can't actually speak to Canada because I don't know what's going on in Canada. I can speak to the UK though. So in the UK. He was ordering, uh, ordering PCSK9 yeah. never from Canada. Yeah. So there's a couple of issues. Um, I could speak to the UK as an example. So the UK is nationalized healthcare, and so the UK um, healthcare system covers things that are recommended by the NICE guidelines. So similar to the way uh, CMS requires coverage for things that are recommended by USPSTF, theirs are linked to the NICE guidelines and. Um, it was the nice cost. It was a cost-effectiveness analysis presented to Nice that led them to say no to PCSK9s initially. Um, so the issues with that, though, are that some of those cost-effectiveness analyses were actually based on really poorly done studies and um, a lot of bad observational data. So there's um, there's a lesson to be learned from there in that we need good models that can estimate risk, estimate cost effectiveness, and then I think we need to figure out how to go beyond, you know, the trial included any patient with ASCVD, that's probably not who we need to be going after for an indication, and I think the companies would have done better to have a smaller, more targeted indication to NICE. Now, that's just a totally different healthcare system, and NICE is able to say, we're going to pay for it only if it's cost effectiveness in these different groups. We're not doing that in the U.S. right now, um, because there's not really any incentives to do that. I think some of the kind of concepts of covered lives or, you know, as you get more of an ACO type uh, group, you're going to have more stakeholders in trying to, you know, willing to shell out more money for the highest risk patients. Um, but we're not there yet. Now, Canada, one of the reasons why the price is lower in Canada is because they don't have all of this um, kind of rebates and discount system that we have in the U.S. In fact, I think what you go pay out of pocket in Canada for a PCSK9 is probably what uh, Anthem or CVS is paying for a PCSK9 under the table. We just don't know it. Um, and so if we had better legislation on price transparency, there might actually be patients who are able to afford not generics from Canada, but or not generics, but you know afford buying it from Canada. They could afford buying it from the U.S. They just need access to those same rebates that everybody else gets. I think kind of connected to a point you make is is a trialist is something else I'm worried about. So, you know, if you have increased uptake of some of these therapies in other countries and it's kind of these temporal changes, what we're worried about is in our randomized trials that are now ongoing, that in certain regions of the world you'll have more drop in these other therapies. So say for instance we're doing a large study of a new heart failure agent in Europe where they're using much more Entresto already. So in those patients that are worsening over the course of the trial, potentially in the placebo arm, if you think your therapy works, that that group is much more likely to have Entresto drop-in. So it's this com complicated concept of when there's so much regional variation, whether it's coverage or use of these drugs and temporal changes, I think it has the potential to affect you know, our ongoing clinical trials in a way that we may not fully anticipate in terms of event rates and, and other aspects. Thank you for an awesome talk today. Is there a place for DCRI in influencing or holding industry accountable for reducing the barriers for these um, patients to get access to the medicine and for physicians' burden of time to process the requests? So I think there's a couple of things that DCRI can have a role in. Um, on the latter, sort of lowering the bar or helping providers overcome the barriers. There are ways to do that. So um, we're actually working now um, with the Cerner EHR to sort of get a network of sites up and running to do quality improvement implementation science. And as part of that, we can do things like automating prior authorization paperwork or help uh, patients access copay cards when they're not available. So I see patient access to therapy as part of an entire spectrum of research that DCRI should be accountable for, which is the implementation side of things. How do we get patients on the therapies that we are participating in the trials or running the trials to prove effectiveness? On the former, in terms of lobbying, you know, we haven't, uh, we haven't done as much of a, um, you know, go to Washington and fuss about this. But I think that part of our job as researchers is to, to highlight the magnitude of the problem. You know, my job isn't to um, negotiate, you know, I'm not, I can't, say what the cost actually should be. But I can say, look, 
the PBMs and in, in, in industry haven't been able to come to a reasonable solution. And as a result, the patients and the providers are suffering. So starting to highlight that and continuing to tell the story, we all providers know that this is a, an issue for us in the clinic. But I, I think the public doesn't actually realize the degree to which it's really getting in our way. So part of the challenge, and both of you guys did a phenomenal job, first off note, um, is that, that at least the example that Anne Marie used was one of a drug that cost $14,000. And all of us sit here and say, um, you know, this is just gouging on the part of the pharma industry. Um, and although I think you discovered underneath it all, there are, there's a, it's complicated. There's a lot of things of where that money all goes and who pays it and who gets it and all those things. But at the end of the day, it is a lot of money. And the question is, are the lessons that you learned here generalizable to other areas, such as the ones even Rob talked about? Um, and so that would be question one. The, the second part of this is we look at the effects of this both. You've looked at it at the patient level and the provider level. There is one more that you all in this room should understand, and that's um, at the level of our business and what we're trying to do. We're trying to get things that will make a difference for patients developed and ultimately proven and then ultimately to patients so that we make them better. Um, Right after the AHA, I had a meeting with one of the major sponsors who was talking about developing a quote-unquote new wonder drug. Now, whether this drug will actually be able to do what they think it'll do is, is, is a big leap between here and there. But they had developed a drug which was hopefully going to prevent uh, clots forming where they weren't supposed to, but have no bleeding associated with it, like the wonder we've drug. Heard you, we've heard this once, <laughs> yes. We've heard this one. And if I got a bridge for you. Um, but... The company was now having a meeting, this meeting that I participated in, was with payers and PBMs to try to decide whether or not they were going to invest the millions and millions of dollars they were going to have to invest in to get this drug to the marketplace. And they put forth this scenario, and we're all, like as clinicians, salivating. They're looking at a 30% reduction in events and no safety signals. It was just like everything you could ever dream of. And the PBMs and payer groups are like, Okay, is the plane leaving early here? Because we're not, you know, how much would you be willing to pay extra for that? Nothing was the answer. We don't want this drug developed, and we're going to put it on the level that's going to be rejected every time it comes out, almost regardless, because we know it's going to be a little bit more expensive than the, than the current one. And we said, well, but what about all the savings and bleeding events? And they're like, that's somebody else's budget. So it was a very interesting meeting, and I, you know, I'm hopeful that it doesn't kill the incentive, but it actually does affect all of us in a, you know, indirect fashion. But back to question one, how do you affect, um, does this, the messages you've learned carry over to Rob's drugs or other drugs that we talked about? It sort of depends on for whom, right? If one of the problems with PCSK9s is you know, the, the, the uh, companies weren't <laughs> complaining when their stock shot up after early effectiveness studies showed that the drug might work, and people did these huge estimates of what the size of their market was, and at this cost, how much money they're going to make. So when they were touting it in their press releases for how much money they're going to make on their new blockbuster drug, and their uh, share prices rose, they weren't complaining about the hype. But then on the flip side, when people said, but it's going to cost a ton of money and bankrupt the system, they said, well, no one's actually going to pay that much, and we're not going to use it that much. So there's a little bit of, um, you know, uh, probably need to hit the middle in the pendulum of, um, you know, reasonable expectations up front. Um, and, you know, that's a, that's a pharmaceutical company issue, a, a marketing issue. But, you know, you'll scare off, you know, people scare everybody off about Entresto if you talk about the size of the market and how much money you're going to make because that means it's cost to the system. But where I think I'm going to come across as a big lefty socialist here, but I think this is where government, like increased access to government health insurance actually would help make a difference. And the reason for that is because a lot, if you look at private payers, patients switch insurances really frequently every two to three years. That's why we have so much turnover in our like market scan studies, for example, because they're switching insurance. So if you're sitting as the, you know, head of a, of a private insurance company, you're not necessarily invested in five or 10 year outcomes because the likelihood is that the patient's going to flip to another payer anyways. If you're Medicare, that's not true. The patients are stuck with Medicare forever, and it's not a different pot of money that pays for the drugs that also pays for the events. It's all out of the same pot. 
their negotiating power is really incredibly high. But um, unlike Medicaid, Medicare has not allowed uh, the, the pharmaceutical companies have managed to, to limit the negotiating power of Medicare. So I would argue that um, you know, in, in order for any of these drugs to have a better uh, you know, access for patients and lower costs, that we should probably be leveraging more of Medicare's power um, because they also have skin in the long-term game. I'm not actually sure if that answered your question, <laughs> but that's my thought. Rob? My short answer was yes. I, as she was <laughs> presenting this, I wish we could insert Entresto into each of her slides and better understand, because we don't have that information. So I think that's what forums like this are really so supportive of, right? So she's doing all this incredible work. We're wondering, how do we understand the actual barriers? Well, she already has the answer. So I think really leveraging a similar strategy in, in different disease states. What kind of training do doctors receive to kind of make sure that their patients are getting proper care, you know, when they're a fellow, for example? Is it basically like you're thrown into it, or? Uh, <laughs> Hi, I'm your fellow in clinic. I think this patient needs a PCSK9. Good luck getting that approved. Oh, I'm going to do it. Don't think so. And then I just did the forms. So the, the answer is the answer is zero. It's sort of training by it's training by experience. But honestly, it's very rare that the doctors are actually doing it. I mean, call a spade a spade. It's the nurses and nurse clinicians um, that are are handling the paperwork, and it's pulling them away from actually patient care. So instead of my nurses talking to patients about adherence or are they you know how's their how's their chest pain blah blah blah, they're calling insurers and waiting on hold to do paperwork. John, you have a well, yeah, I was going to say that there's, Emory, in your analyses, you started with prescription, and there's a whole other set of barriers before that, that he, he, these uh, processes that are necessary to get prior authorization and approval are sufficient barriers that lots of doctors don't write prescriptions. Yep. Um, and yeah. because it's, they, don't, they don't know how to do all the pre-authorization stuff or and then don't want to try to figure it out and it's too difficult. And that's part of why there's this 15-year lag time that over those 15 years eventually some people retire and some new people come along and they learn they do learn how and it becomes more no, a normal part of the process and they give up i mean i think yeah or, or they, they prescribe it a few times and then they quit it, the other piece about this related to the dcri though is um you know we we sort of all want our cake and eat it too in the u.s we want very safe drugs that have been tested in multiple clinical trials we even have now requirements for clinical trials to prove certain safety endpoints like heart failure events and diabetes drugs that is unrelated to cardiovascular outcomes. So we want more and more data about the safety of drugs, and yet we're not willing to pay hefty price tags. Now, there are issues. We are in a capitalist system, and our pharmaceutical companies are accountable to their shareholders, not to the public health authorities. So their job is to make money. Um, but the one thing that we can do to help control costs of drug development is to help control the cost of clinical trials. And I think we're sort of doing that. Um, we're probably leading the way with adaptable and other pragmatic clinical trials. But as long as clinical trials cost what they do, I don't think we can expect new therapies to, to come down that much in price. Well, I don't, I mean, the, the bigger elephant in the room is that, you know, all of healthcare costs are going up. And so that's why there's not much of an appetite on behalf of payers to say, oh, yeah, we're going to give access to any evidence-based medicine that costs a lot of money. Uh, but it's also, I think part of it is um, that, you know, in, in regard to our, our business at DCRI, we have the clinical trial side, but we also have our health services research and outcomes research that shows that a lot of patients are not taking the medications. They're inexpensive generic medications appropriately. Um, you know, 30% of our hospitalizations are um, preventable. Um, and there, there are lots of other things that can be done. So I think that somehow seeps into the thinking for a lot of payers that say, well, there are a lot of low-cost things that we could do to drive down costs. And if we did that, maybe we'd have more money for these, these other, you know, these other evidence-based medications that are coming out. And, you know, with the survey that you're doing amongst providers, um, I didn't see um, a checkbox on there that was, 
um, something that would give us some insight into, I don't think this patient is adhering to their generic medications. You know, we're not doing all we can um, with, with sort of more efficient ways to maximize and improve health outcomes. Yeah, I think really important points. And what you've highlighted nicely is that e of even these other evidence-based therapies, still only 30% of our patients are on mineral corticoid receptor antagonists. So yes, it, it, you know, it's a complicated landscape and incorporating these different perspectives of understanding. It's not just these getting these new therapies, but they're having a really strong background therapy for therapies that they should already be on anyways. I agree completely. I have one final thought because I can't help myself. So, um, <laughs> so I don't know if you guys saw the news that um, uh, Anthem bought CVS or vice versa yesterday. So you have CVS, CVS. buying Aetna. CVS buying Aetna. They're all the same to me. But the point is these are two of the biggest pharmacy benefit managers. So we talk about the rising cost of health care. Um, but one of the things that has also happened over the last decade is the rising profit margins for pharmacy benefit managers who are allegedly saving money for us. But in fact, th we have the development of a completely new middleman who is making billions and billions of dollars and as far as I can tell, may or may not be providing a service more than they are interested in just padding their pockets. So the fact that merger makes me think that there is potential big shakeup for Amazon entering into the pharmacy space. That was a direct response to Amazon. So I'm actually optimistic that new delivery models that don't include um, PBMs or that can use sort of Amazon-like services to get drugs to patients um, might end up disrupting the system in a way that can lead to lower costs. I want to keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we'll see. So thanks so much to our speakers for um, really provocative and insightful um, talk today. And we hope you all join us next week for our final research forum of the semester with Callum McRae from Boston, who will be telling us about AHA's One Brave Idea. Thank you.